Um, so yeah, I'll show you what I put together and, and we'll talk about it. Um, so I found this pretty insightful. It caused me to like, I've, I've read, I've listened to and talked about this stuff before. Um, it wasn't unfamiliar to me, uh, but I think what was different in this exercise um, was that I really did a lot of like self-reflection and, and discovery and picked out quite a few interesting things, things that I had never thought about since I was, since they happen sometimes when you're a kid and you realize how they can impact your, uh, um, I guess this, the tools you use to keep yourself safe or the strategies that you use to keep yourself safe. Uh, so this attachment theory, um, I kind of broke it down into three parts, just like what is, you know, this area, this concept, where does it come from, that kind of idea. Um, and then what are those different attachment styles that exist, the four attachment styles um, under attachment theory. And there's like small variances. Some people give them different names, but we're kind of talking about the same ideas when you understand kind of how I describe mm -hmm. these things. Um, and then getting into obviously uh, actionable tools. Uh, what are some things now that I've kind of figured some of this stuff out that I can um, just start being aware of? And, and we always like to give the actionable tools uh, element at the end, just to leave people with something that they can integrate or work on or think about or um, you know talk to their partner about or whatever. So let's talk about attachment theory and why it's important uh, to look at this, or at least why I think it's important uh, to look at this. And you know, we're, we're growing on this journey uh, of becoming awesome men. Um, and, and that's really all about, you know, awareness, right? At the end of the day, like learning uh, how, why and where our, our subconscious behaviors are coming from and understanding, you know, with compassion and like a willingness to learn and grow um, kind of what's driving some of those things. Um, and Mark's trying to get in as well. Just give me one sec. I might have to escape to activate my mouse. Shoot. Hmm. Dan, if you want to make uh, either Ty or I co-host, we can... Yeah, I can. Work. I've just... Um, for some reason, my mouse isn't working. And I can't escape. There we go. I'll let Mark in. Um, I'll make you uh, co-host, Greg. Um, I'll just... Yeah, I'll just make you a co-host just in case. Right on. And then I'll jump back into this. So is Mark, uh, welcome in a minute. We can just, we're talking about attachment theory today, Mark, if you can hear us yet. Uh, and I'm just introducing the topic. Um, and so, you know, why, why is this attachment theory kind of important? And as I said earlier, you know, as we grow um, on this journey, uh, it's all about awareness. It's all about recognizing our, un our subconscious and unconscious behavior drivers and some of these things that happen, um, you know, and with that awareness, uh, you know, we can implement change, we can grow, we can learn better strategies, there's things that serve us better, um, and understand kind of what makes us tick. So, um, you know, that's why this is just another lens at the end of the day, where we can understand, you know, what causes us to uh, maybe behave in certain ways, especially when we're aware of those patterns, and, and even what causes our, um, our partners to do the same. Um, and coming into that situation with more of a growth mindset, more empathy, more understanding, more clarity. Um, so as I said in this last point here, you know, it, it helps us with empathy because we expand our perspective. We can we can understand, you know, why and and and, and somebody's going through something and, and what's causing them, um, you know, perhaps to, um, to 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 certain behaviors or certain strategies. Um, so yeah, this created some pretty cool conversations even yesterday between uh, Jeanette and I. Um, and so, you know, what are attachment styles? So I was talking about attachment theory and basically there's been a huge, I was quite surprised, a body of research in this area that's been going on for a really long time. Um, and, and all of this, uh, you know, science, call it whatever you like, has been aggregated. And, and these are the themes that are very consistent throughout that body of research. And so quite a large volume of, of psychologists and other types are, are talking about this kind of stuff quite regularly. There's a shit ton of books on it. There's entire podcasts on it. It's, it's really, really um, uh, got a lot of material and, and, and available information out there. Um, and, and it's pretty, I think, uh, I, I didn't hear a lot of conflict about it. Like it's pretty consistently adopted, not as a, as a final, you know, categorization or a diagnosis or, or, 
or, or, or like ultimate labels, but at the end of the day that, you know, everybody seems to agree that these types of things are going on. And so it's kind of interesting that um, I didn't see a lot of, you know, contrarian type stuff uh, when I was looking at all of this information. Um, and so, as I've said, like, what are attachment styles? And I'll get into the four uh, areas later, but they're strategies, right? At the end of the day, what we need to understand is that the way that we grow up, the way that we're um, in relationship with our parents as younger children, the way that we have experiences in previous relationships and our environment that shapes some of our behaviors as well, we develop these strategies uh, to keep, uh, to get our needs met, to keep ourselves safe. And um, in relationship, you know, these attachment styles are really um, a generalization in some way, but a categorization of those types of strategies that people tend to uh, gravitate to, depending on what type of attachment style they have. Um, and so we'll get into that in, in, in a little bit. And I just wanted to talk about a few tidbits of additional information before we get into this topic, just to kind of set the stage or, or, or some of the, the perspectives a little bit, you know, differently than some might when they get into some of this information. Um, you know, but understanding that these are just labels based on a bunch of data collected in this space. And as with any science or data or otherwise, it's it's not perfect. Um, <clears throat> and there are generalizations. And so um, some things might fit, some things might not. Uh, we just need to be open-minded about that kind of stuff. Um, and we can have, you know, different behaviors. We can be a combination of some of these elements, depending on the circumstances, depending on the times in our lives or otherwise what's going on. So just being open you know, to that kind of thing. Um, and because of that, like these aren't a diagnosis. It's not like a personality type or some other type is like you're anxiously attached and you will always be anxiously attached. Like it's not that kind of situation. Um, there, there, there's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing broken about us. Um, you know, these are just things to help us understand why we might behave certain ways at certain times. Um, and, and as with any behavior, you know, they can be changed, right? We can learn new strategies. We can become aware and, and learn of new ways that we can deal with some of these things. Um, so <clears throat> don't, don't get attached to these labels. Don't get narrowly, you know, subject matter expert trying to explain everything from the attachment theory lens. Like this is just extra information that we can use as a tool, right? As we work on that journey towards, um, you know, becoming fully human, be, becoming more aware, more conscious, more fully present, all of these things um, uh, are helpful towards ultimately that goal, right? So let's talk about the styles. And essentially there's, you know, di four different styles that have developed in this space. One is secure attachment, which is ultimately, I think, what people seek, uh, you know, to, to reach a, at some point where you're, you know, nicely, uh, securely attached. Um, and, and there's then the rest of, of the attachment styles fall under that insecure side. Uh, and, and, and that's what we'll get into in, in, in this section here. Um, so as I said, secure attachment and then the insecure attachment styles. Um, so ideally secure attachment is what we're looking for. You know, it give, gives us a, we're comfortable, we're content in relationship. Um, you know, we're good communicators. Um, we're not clingy. Um, we don't get overly anxious. Uh, or, or, or worried, um, you know, about um, things that anxiously attached people might get fearful about, and we can get into that in a minute. Um, but just a nice kind of stable, um, you know, coexisting kind of beautiful partnership, obviously, is what we're looking for. And, and between, you know, securely attached people, most of the time, right? We, these things shift, these things change, but that's um, kind of the, the, the ultimate balance that I think we should be looking for. Um, and then when we look at the insecure attachment styles, you know, um, anxious, anxious attachment, uh, you know, th that's that, um, strategy where there's this clinginess, this insecurity, this anxiety about being left alone, about, you know, being, uh, you know, broken up with about, you know, not being good enough. Um, and that often, uh, will translate into these, like this real clinginess, this real neediness, these high intimacy needs, um, you know, that outrageous, uh, anger, you don't text back in 30 seconds, like all these kinds of things would be, you know, in that anxious attachment kind of style. And all of these are uh, on a continuum, of course, right? So you've got that extreme anxious attachment behavior. And, you know, I can identify elements of anxious attachment in, in my behavior in previous relationships, but, you know, it's, it's all a, a continuum and, and, and understanding kind of where that comes from is interesting sometimes. Um, and then you've got two avoidance styles. You've got the dismissive avoidant, and, um, and the fearful avoidant. 
And I've, you know, the way that this has been described as the dismissive avoidant is that fiercely independent type, you know, really protective of their autonomy, um, tend to have lower intimacy needs, struggle with vulnerability, and, and really pull away and isolate themselves when, when they feel unsafe, right? As I said earlier, these are strategies that we learn to keep ourselves safe, to get our needs met when, you know, uh, in previous relationships or in our childhood. So at the end of the day, the dismissive avoidant type will tend to retract, tend to pull away, tend to isolate um, and, and, and be very kind of um, you know, dismissive. And the fearful avoidant um, is, a, is a little bit different. And, and the way that I understand it um, is um, there's obviously that, that real desire for intimacy, but um, as soon as things get too close to that intimacy, there's this fear that kicks in. There's this unsafety, um, this anxiety for whatever reason. Um, and, and so there's this push pull cause they want, and then they get afraid and they want, and they get afraid. And I've been in that kind of relationship too. It's really interesting to understand, um, you know, these dynamics kind of present themselves in, in these kinds of, of relationships. Um, and I was particularly curious about this one, uh, because of a previous relationship that I had. And, um, uh, when I dug into the psychology of this particular type, um, often characterized by, you know, a very volatile like family situation where, um, you know, that that intimacy was desired, but there was a lot of uh, inconsistency or unpredictability in in the parent and their behavior and sometimes, you know, rage or anger, other times, you know, softness and, and kindness. And it creates this real um, unpredictable, unsafe environment. Um, and, and that's often a common factor in the, the fearful avoidance history from what I was reading and listening to in this particular area, but just kind of interesting stuff to understand. And so um, I put this, I found a little graph that I thought was, was pretty helpful to kind of elaborate some of these ideas, but going from like low avoidance to high, high avoidance and low anxiety to high anxiety does a good job of describing these areas and anxious avoidant, as I would understand it would be the fearful avoidant and then the other side would be that dismissive avoidant that might have a little bit less anxiety than the fearful avoidant, right? Um, and so just kind of understanding these visually helps me kind of under, uh, visualize that spectrum or that continuum that I talked about. So sometimes you could be way out in one corner, that would be problematic and probably some pretty excessive behaviors that characterize that style. But usually we're probably floating, you know, in some circle uh, around, you know, two or three of these categories. And just to keep that in mind as you um, as you digest some of this information. Um, so let's get into actionable tools. Um, and I really wanted to discuss this stuff, so I'm not going to spend um, a ton of time uh, uh, on the presentation part. I want to get into conversation, especially with um, some of you and your experience in this area. But um, one thing I wanted to kind of take away from this is we, we can evaluate our, our attachment style. We can um, we can understand kind of where that's coming from. Some of these tools are around kind of that self-discovery, that, you know, self-evaluation. Um, and I, I like to read these things and understand like, you know, how, how can I put this into practice or when I'm talking to others, kind of how can I help them put some of this stuff in, into practice? Um, and, and one element, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of different recommendations and things that you can do in these areas. And I pick the ones that I tended to um, to like the best. And that's just my own opinion. I'd encourage you to listen to this stuff in more detail if you're curious about some of these areas. But, um, you know, one lady that I was listening to her podcast on, on, on attachment, it's called by Stephanie Rigg. Um, you know, she says like, you know, when you're, when you're looking at healing, you know, uh, one of the insecure attachment styles that you may be um, emulating in your behavior quite often, you know, like what environment are you creating, you know, in your relationship is what she's asking, like evaluating that. And is it a dysfunctional, um, you know, high stress, high blame kind of environment, or is it one that's growth oriented? And what are you doing in order to enable some of that growth and communication and other things to happen? So it's always nice to think back to that. I felt that was an appropriate thing to, to repeat here is, you know, what environment are you creating? Like, are you just blaming the other person and waiting for things to get corrected um, and, and not doing much, you know, to help that growth oriented environment in a, in, in a good direction? Um, so I thought that was quite valuable. Um, I've been that blamer and, uh, and it, it's not, uh, it's not productive, right? It, it just, you end up just, um, getting shakier and getting more distant and, um, and, uh, it takes up a lot of energy and that's definitely not what we, what we want at the end of the day. And then getting that mindset, right? Like I mentioned some things earlier, 
we're not broken. These are just strategies. These are just behaviors. New behaviors can be learned. New strategies can be learned. Our consciousness grows and we make better decisions perhaps as that expands over time and we learn more and, and, and um, get more self-aware. Um, but just getting that right mindset, that growth oriented mindset, that, you know, non, uh, non blame kind of mindset where you're looking for opportunities to actually improve and, and move. And you realize you're, we're all imperfect and, and, and that's why we're here right at the end of the day. Um, and, uh, which is why I always like to remind myself and others, like there's always work to be done. So that's, uh, so there needs to be ownership and accountability, a willingness to kind of identify where there's opportunities for growth, um, and, and owning that. Right. So I, I always like to, that's my own, but I, um, but it's consistent with these other areas. Um, and, and this was one that came up quite a bit, uh, and, it's, it's interesting how these different presentations on different areas kind of tie in several times in different points. Um, and we talked a lot during the uh, masculinity and relationship element about regulating our nervous system, the ability to be responsive versus reactive. Um, and even in this area, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's about, again, regulating our nervous system and uh, being in the driver's seat of, of perhaps, you know, how we're behaving and how we're, you know, consciously uh, responding to situations. Um, and, and the more we're able to create space to regulate that nervous system, to be aware of when unconscious patterns or drivers might be creating a situation, um, you know, that would typically cause us to behave unconsciously. Uh, there's many opportunities in this space to identify, oh shit, that's what's going on there. That's interesting. How can I deal with this differently? Right. And creating that opportunity, the more times we have that kind of self check and, and we're kind of aware of what's happening and we can almost evaluate whether that's the way we want to continue or if we want to try or, or change something or do something else, you know, all that's possible when we're able to regulate our nervous system, when we're able to mitigate that um, unconscious movement into like sympathetic nervous system response where we're just basically reactive and, and it's like fight, flight, freeze kind of response, right? Um, and so that's really important. So the more space we can create, the more that we can regulate our nervous system, the, the more we can probably notice and, and, uh, and catch ourselves and, and uh, initiate different strategies, different behaviors and see how that goes. Um, and so, you know, another one in the space is, is really understanding our past trauma, our past triggers, um, so that we can be less reactive. Like when we're aware of these things and we're compassionate and we're um, and, and we're able to regulate our nervous system, then we're able to identify these things uh, and, and where they're coming from and why, right? That bigger knowledge of, of self-discovery and otherwise. Um, and, and with that, you know, we can, we can respond consciously. Um, and the more that we're able to do that, you know, the more that I think we build our sense of self-worth, our sense of self-trust, um, and that's huge. And in this space, particularly, you know, I'm one of those guys that often in a relationship when I would be asked by partners that would just say, oh, I had a normal childhood. Like my parents were both around and they were both like super supportive of us. And I never really had uh, anything bad, like, you know, um, and, and, it, and, and that's probably okay. Like, I think most people maybe had a similar experience in some ways or another, um, but it doesn't mean that, you, you know, things didn't happen despite your parents' best efforts to be the best parents they could be um, that really causes um, you know, some scars or traumas that really affect your behavior. And in this space, like, you know, I, 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 Jeanette and I were, were talking about this a little bit. Um, I'm definitely, if I were to start um, emulating some unconscious behaviors that don't serve me best, I, I'm probably in the dismissive avoidant camp. I get really autonomous, really uh, withdrawn um, and, and, and don't uh, uh, show affection or those kinds of things. Um, and, and I really evaluated like my childhood and, uh, have a good relationship with my, with my mom and my dad until he passed away and no, no issues there. But I do remember little tiny bits of things that would happen. And I remember I was quite young, I don't know, like eight or something. And I remember kissing my mom on the lips and she actually pushed me away and said, I'm not your girlfriend, which is like a really innocuous thing when you think about it. But when you think about it, like, I look at Declan who's seven. And if something like that were to happen, like that can really create like an interesting, uh, riff that could last or culminate and add on to other things that ultimately create, you know, somebody that has maybe an avoidant uh, attachment style when they've experienced those kinds of things that can add up to perhaps shape their behavior in certain ways. So um, it, it gave me a different perspective to not look at you looking for when I think about, you know, bad childhoods, you think about big things, right? Like, um, you know, a raging alcoholic, angry father or abuse or other kinds of things, right? And, and it doesn't mean that there's 
little things that don't happen uh, that can really shape your behavior. And so uh, it kind of humbled me a little bit to be a bit more uh, particular, maybe sometimes and open-minded about the types of things that can really cause you to behave or act in certain ways and to be open to, to what those might be and, and, and why, as opposed to just thinking everything's fine. And there's <laughs> just, uh, and then you get kind of lost in, in that self-discovery work. Um, and what was interesting about this, I, I talked earlier about just tying things to earlier presentations, um, but, you know, responding consciously and, and building our sense of self-trust and self-worth. Um, we, we talked about boundaries recently and enforcing our boundaries. And when we do that, you know, it's a way of trusting that we can keep ourselves safe and that we can, um, you know, keep that self-worthiness as well. Um, so I just added that just to tie this into the previous conversation. Um, and, and again, boundaries discover that we discover our needs and, and learn to communicate about them. And we, we talked about that as well. Um, so I just wanted to try to tie that full circle to the boundaries discussion um, before we get into discussion about this uh, uh, attachment theory stuff. Um, but that's it, guys. And uh, next week, we'll do the empathy uh, discussion, which I had done before, but um, because things didn't work out with attendance, we just pushed it to another time. So we'll get through that next week. And there's some interesting tie-ins to this stuff that we talked about this week uh, or that I just presented and, and the boundaries discussion as well. Um, so on that note, um, I'd love to uh, hear your guys' perspectives on this. Um, not to single you out, Joel, but I know your experience in this space is probably pretty pretty strong. Uh, and I'd love to hear um, what you have to say about it as well. And uh, welcome, Mark. Nice to see you, brother. Uh, you came in uh, partway through. I just wanted to say hi. And, uh, and that was it. <laughs> So what do you think, guys? Thanks, Dan. That was awesome. You're doing such a good job, like laying these. These are massively complex topics, right? You can you could write a series of books about each one of these. Um, yeah. But yeah, great, great job distilling it and giving us manageable things to chew on and think about and and talk about. Yeah, totally. You're welcome. Yeah, likewise. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm still I'm still sort of wrestling with all these different styles here and trying to see what quadrant I might land in. But <laughs> it may be similar to you, Dan, probably somewhere in that dismissive avoidant. Yeah. And then like and then like oddly though, like the flip side would be the anxious attachment kind of thing. It's like, I don't know, kind of the polarities of that where you're having a shitty day or a shitty month or whatever, and you pull back a little bit and then your spouse or your girlfriend or whatever pulls back and it's like, no, 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 wait. It's like, I didn't mean for that to happen. And right. You, kind of, and, you know, and you kind of end up digging this hole a little bit, but without really okay. intending to. Yeah. Just, I, just, I, I resonate so much with that. It's almost like you push as far as you think you can with your like dismissive avoidance. And then it's like, oh, wait, I went too far. Oh, shit. Now she's now she's really pissed. Uh oh, and then you're like almost anxious that oh, I, I pushed that one a little bit too far. And you're even aware of it. Right. It's like a stupid game. Sometimes it's uh, um, that you play with yourself. Yeah, but it's like, but I don't know why. I, I guess I'm I don't know, like what are what are some of the roots of these things, though? So you'd mentioned the yeah. one, right? Like saying, you know, yeah. relationship with your parents and stuff like that. What like what kind of creates this like anxious clingy? Well, and, and I'm sure Greg has some interesting things to say about this, but what I would say in that space is that uh, deep down, like we want that intimacy, right? We want that closeness. We want that, that connection. Um, but when it, when, you know, certain things happen uh, for whatever reason, we're like, oh fuck, we're not safe. Or we get like all of a sudden uh, and, and we almost like sabotage it, right? Um, to keep ourselves safe, ironically, but it's it's not working like very well for us at the end of the day. Uh, but it's a strategy that we've learned somehow and it's it's unconscious behavior often at the, often uh, times, if not most of the time. And, uh, uh, and, and it's because we're ultimately, uh, our unconscious behavior is driving us towards safety. And it's, uh, it's something that's been obviously created or molded through our experiences in our previous relationships and other things. Uh, um, I saw you nodding a few times, Greg, so I'm not totally uh, out to lunch on that space. Yeah, you're, you're bang on, Dan. And uh, one thing I love about all the stuff you bring to us every week is that it's, it's so practical and tangible for us as men. Um, the deeper I get into marriage and 
being a dad every time i turn around i have another another human being in my house yeah. <laughs> uh, but the deeper i go into that the, the more interested i become in um in this pursuit of healthy masculinity and the the, the incredible gifts that it provides for us as men and one thing that struck me as you were showing the quadrants is that sometimes the more the, the, the less overt things we do as men um the less overt things we do wrong can be more catastrophic sometimes we think as men like i'm paying the bills i'm you know mowing the grass doing the stuff but a little bit of anxious avoidance can be so destabilizing for women's nervous systems and they may not even be able to articulate but if they notice that you're avoiding things that are hard if they notice that you're you develop anxiety and you feel out of control even if you're not showing it um it it can really erode your connection with your wife it can erode her safe her sense of safety in the home and these things start to play on each other and now you feel her pulling back you're more anxious she feels you getting more anxious she feels more unsafe now she's coming into masculinity to try to protect you're feeling like so these things can can go from something seemingly innocuous um pretty quickly into um, a downward spiral and so it's there's so much to unpack with this stuff but uh I'm so grateful that we're having these conversations because it gives us tools to identify and then surrender into ways to be more fully in our masculine, which is good for us, good for our families, our communities, good for everybody. Yeah. And and when Stephanie Rigg in her first kind of one of, she has 10 tips. I just took a couple of them, but, you know, checking in on that environment, like, is it that, that downward spiral of blame and pointing the finger and, um, or is it like, hey, like, let's stop that downward spiral. Let's like step up. And but I will say, like, when your partner asks you, like, what type of style do you think she is? Be very careful. <laughs> that question. Yeah. I haven't quite, true. I haven't, and I can't tell you how this one ends yet. It's it's been going on for about a day, <laughs> but it ends somewhere. <laughs> it's funny. <clears throat> Sounds like a do I look fat in this dress type of a question. <laughs> it is yeah yeah for sure it's like it's the modern uh the modern males uh catch 22 it used to be i do i look fat in this dress now it's like what what attachment style do you think i am <laughs> <laughs> yeah huh. so all i need help with that one how do i how do i navigate that one? <laughs> well it's it's about you know all this stuff is i've come to think of it more as like because there's always the danger that we take these concepts and we just kind of apply them to ourselves, kind of like, this is who I am, this is what I am, right? And I found over the years and in my own experience that it's more, it's more, I don't know, flexible than that. It's more, you know, um, amorphous than that, I guess. So I find with attachment styles, even in my own experience, it's like anytime we're in our weakness is generally when we tend to display the more anxious or avoidant attachment styles. I think we all have the tendency to, or the possibility, I guess, to go into any one of them for different reasons. There may be one, it's kind of like representational systems. There may be one that's a go-to for us yeah. um, more often than other ones because of the way we were brought up. You know, anxious avoidant generally comes from abusive house, households and abusive parents and things like that. Um, or it could be, you know, abusive relationships, past relationships even, right? Um, but I find it's usually it's a sign, like when you notice you're doing this, these things for men, I think it's really a good moment when you can say, okay, I'm not being present because as soon as you're in avoidance or anxiousness or anxious avoidance, then you're, you're not present anymore. You're in your head. You're thinking about maybe the future or the past or something that's happened. You're not in the current moment. So I tend to frame it more as when you're in your weakness you tend to be exhibiting these kind of behaviors. Um, so I guess that's a day to go to your question, Dan. I think it's a day. Um, what somebody is a better way to frame it is what somebody's go to when yeah. they're anxious rather than saying this is what you are. You know, yeah. what's your go to when you're stressed out or what's your go to when you're, you know, and I do I, as men, I'd say we tend to go to avoidance more than anything, but that's due to the nature of the masculine. Like we want to 
reduce the amount of distractions and energy movement and things going on, especially when we're in a place where we're, you know, anxious about something, it might not even be our partner, right? Um, so we tend to go into that avoidant kind of control space, Dan, I think that's kind of my go to, I'd say, and when I get in myself as well. And, and I've noticed that with uh, a bunch of my partners, I tend to go into that kind of avoidant kind of control space, I guess. Um, I don't know, I could look at where it comes from growing up, you know, I grew up on my own a lot. I was like a latchkey kid. I grew up in the mid 80s. So my parents were always gone. Like I so I learned to be by myself. So I guess that's my go to safe space. If we think of it from that perspective, but I've noticed in my experience, I tend to attract or go for a lot of anxious avoidant partners. Um, and so there's something in there for me to look at that, right, in terms of my own, you know, I'm triggering them, obviously, with my avoidant behavior. Um, but I tend to get that anxious avoidant attachment style, which is the hardest one to work with, I guess, in terms of, and, you know, knowing what I know about relationships, I try not to, you know, I say this to all my partners, I'm like, I don't want to coach you, I don't want to, you know, but always they ask the question, Dan, it's always like, well, what do you think? What do you think I am? And I'm like, oh my God, here we go, right? <laughs> so it's kind of hard, but I always, I guess, would frame it as in, you know, we go to these places in our weakness rather than saying, this is what I am. Because um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we could go to any one of them, depending on the situation. Like if we're in a situ, if we're in a relationship where there's a bit of abuse, we might tend to have some more anxiousness and, and avoidance, right? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think it is really useful to understand these attachment styles for sure. Mm -hmm. And like, how do we get to that secure space? It, it really is about being, for, for men, it is really about being, pulling yourself into presence and going, okay, mm -hmm. you know, how am I in my weakness in this moment? Am I trying to avoid this moment or am I trying to control this moment? You know, usually anxiousness is about control. We're trying to control. Um, avoidance is about escaping or running away from the moment. So, right. Yeah. Are we know. keeping ourselves safe by controlling the situation or by running away from it? But absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Makes sense. And, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then even examining if it is safety when we get to those spaces, right? Or it's not really. Obviously, we know that with our partners. If we try to, yeah. we run away from them, we come back and it ain't safe. Anymore. It's like, <laughs> so, yeah. What were you going to say, Mark? Yeah. I, I'm sitting here thinking that I think there's a good chance a great deal of these anxious avoidance situations with a partner um, begin elsewhere. And as I think we talked the other day, uh, when you come home, there's a compensation factor going on. Mm -hmm. uh, you feel sadly towards us and towards our partners i think it's more common than we like to admit that we're more willing to take out certain emotions with the people that we care about and love the most rather than it, what i'm saying is it gets triggered at work or gets triggered uh in a sport or something and you come home and this is uh boiling underneath the surface and triggers the anxious avoidance between yourself and your partner. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know, I guess, I don't, don't know what point to have behind that other than mm -hmm. working on, working on it where the source is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like lots of environmental factors definitely contribute to these behaviors. And if we can be more present and, and, uh, and then stay out of our heads, as Joel says, then hopefully we can um, address it sooner um, before it does blow up at home too. <laughs> no question. Yeah, I resonate with that too, Mark. Just the same as last week. It's when you, when you bring that stuff home and yeah, you become a different person. You, you like you portray a different individual in your work or your sport or whatever. And you come home and you're, you got nothing left and your family yeah. gets the scraps, your loved ones get the scraps. So yeah, you fall into these behaviors because you're not present because you're just in your head or if you're off balance or whatever that looks like. I agree with that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. So my, I guess one of the part of the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, by working on it with your own relationship is that 
where it should begin. Um, if if you believe that's where you should be working on it, but the seed is planted elsewhere, you're you're likely never going to be that successful at home with it. Mm -hmm. Yep. This year, Dan, you've kind of done a good job weaving all this stuff together because at the end of the day, it comes back to like the awareness and the reactive versus responsive mindset and being, yeah, being present. It's crazy. It's pretty much universal. Like awareness solves like 99% of the issues if you can control it. <laughs> and you can, and it helps to be able to say, oh, that's kind of maybe what that is. Like, I understand that uh, I'm aware of it and I understand where it's probably coming from. And then you can actually maybe try to do something differently. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I still, yeah, it's, it's shocking how often I catch myself and I'm like, Ooh, that's that thing on that other topic from a few weeks back. Like that's, ten, I tend to do that quite often, um, as well. Uh, Justin's joining us a bit late, but he's, he's jumping in. So we'll see, I know that he knows about these things. Nice. Yeah. But when you another thing that's been on my mind lately, guys, I'll, I'll do a bit of a share here. We um, we're kind of on the outs with my wife's family. It's not a place I ever thought we'd ever be in. We used to get along famously, but her dad, um, from time to time, just as you said, Joel, not all the time, but when he's when he's triggered, when he's in his pain, he can find himself pretty far out in the anxious avoidant space, and he likes to. He likes to get everyone on the family on his page. And uh, so I've been reflecting on how when we as men uh, turn away from responsibility over our feelings and behavior, how it can put other people in such a tricky spot, right? Because they have to choose between alienating you or um, or tolerating behavior that they shouldn't have to tolerate um, you put them in a tricky spot where they have to choose boundaries that are difficult to navigate. And the, you know, the best solution always is for us to come to the water ourselves and, and with self-compassion, step into all the responsibility we can hold, whatever that is, and then continue taking on more as we're, as we're able responsibility over how we feel over how we react to situations and, and, uh, so yeah, again, it's just a very practical application of of healthy masculinity because we as men have the ability to have awareness, as you said, Dan, about these things and and lean into them, and in doing so, create tremendous amounts of stability and safety for ourselves and our families. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are important conversations. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Greg. Justin, welcome, brother. I don't know if you've um. Have you've probably looked into attachment theory before, the attachment styles like anxious I, student and I have. And oh. actually when I saw you guys talking about this a few weeks ago in the email, I was really excited because I a few weeks ago I actually had a huge uh like trigger and thing to work through all around the attachment styles. Um so I'm anxious attachment and uh you know, I can't remember exactly what happened, but, you know, with my wife, I had a huge trigger around it. And like, it was interesting because I looked back on every single time in our relationship when I um, had like huge, like panic and anxiety attacks around her leaving me or something like that happening. And at, you know, at the time it was this situation, but the actual root of it was that anxious attachment. And when I had that kind of connection, I was able to see, um, all these times, like all the, I would say like all the hardest times in our relationship really have, at least for me, have always been kind of tied around that anxious attachment and, and what it led to. And when I looked into like, you know, healing that, you know, there was, you know, and, you know, if you have a partner who's secure, you can, it's easier. And I'm glad I'm like, there wasn't really any like concrete guidance and they talk a lot about, you know, um, stuff happening in childhood that causes that. And so for me, I kind of took a deep dive back into my childhood. And, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, I was born two months premature. So I was actually in an incubation chamber for 90 days. So I wasn't with my mom for 90 days. So I had that separation from my mom. I also had a twin brother who died at nine days old. So I had 
inspiration from him. And so there was all this stuff like right around the time I was basically born that I was looking at that I think caused this anxious attachment. And, you know, so I did my best to work through like inner child healing and all that kind of stuff. But um, when I saw you guys talking about this, I was excited because I, I actually had, a, you know, some. Awesome. Um, I, I just, one thing we did do uh, just before you came on, Justin, is from a framing point of view, um, like these aren't like a diagnosis or, but they're definitely like strategies or behaviors that are um, developed in our experience, whatever that might be. And you've described two things that I could see being like hugely impactful um, at a, a subconscious, unconscious level. Um, and, uh, you know, what are the strategies that we use to, to keep ourselves, you know, safe and, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's really cool to, um, it, it, and somewhat embarrassing for, for me sometimes to look at like a whole bunch of previous relationships and being like, oh, that was that again. And that again, and that again, and that again, it's like, holy fuck. Like I had no awareness around this kind of stuff until you actually do right at the end of the day. Um, but it can be really liberating in a sense too. It's like, okay, now I kind of understand where that behavior is and where it fits in this in this concept, this lens of, of attachment styles. And, um, and you're like, okay, now I can see where, uh, what I can do. I'm curious, Justin, like, did you find any specific strategies that you felt, um, resonated with you or, or that, that were helpful? Um, if, like there, looking at your uh, past. Yeah. Yeah. There was a solid, like, I'd say week where I felt really like off because I, you know, it, I don't think like when I first heard about attachments, I didn't, I didn't really like kind of dive into it too much. I read about it and I thought it was interesting, but like that was years ago. And I just thought, okay, whatever. But, you know, I remember when me and Amanda, my wife were walking one night and she kind of, I was like, I had this huge fear response. I don't know why. And she brought up the attachment styles again. And I was like, oh yeah, I could look into that. And so that whole week I was like really kind of in the emotions of like, I don't even know. It was just, it felt very like, it was very raw, very vulnerable, but also like, as I looked at my past and all these times that it had happened, it was really clear to me that this was actually a much deeper issue that I had to kind of work through. Like there was so many instances, like you said, of past relationships, past partners, even like friends and family stuff that I had had um, that really like, you know, it was, it was showed up in more than one area of my life. And that's when I knew I had to, you know, this was something serious. And um, I tried, you know, I did a lot of journaling, um, but I think the thing, you know, the, a big part for me is having the awareness. Like once I have the awareness, I find it's a lot easier to move through things when I understand why it's causing these emotions or these feelings and what is the cause of it. Like when I kind of talked to my mom about, you know, my birth and all those things, I asked her, I'm like, how was raising me? And she's like, oh no, you were really taken care of in that sense. But it was like, that was kind of those moments at childbirth where there was all that separation that caused it. And so for me, you know, I did some guided meditation stuff uh, myself, just kind of diving back into those timelines and healing. But I also, for me personally, I just, I actually like writing poetry about stuff like that to help me heal because it helps me like express my emotions, move the energy and kind of get it, release it in a way that's like a creative outlet. I find like that really helps. Like if you can do some kind of creative thing to release the energy. Right on. Thanks for sharing, Justin. Uh, Greg, brother, hands up. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Justin. Really cool that you that you're leaning into that awareness. And if you have ever felt like there's a little bit of that hanging on, a little bit of that um, creating a response that you don't want, you deserve to know that that's um, that's not your fault, but there are ways you can be free. You do have power on that. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned that with the awareness, you're able to work through when, when any time that comes up. And when that comes up, it's simply your human nervous system, which is a quite a primitive artifact, trying to love you, trying to keep you safe, right? It it learned at one point that the the world isn't that safe you know, in error. It learned that the people that are meant to keep me safe, they ain't here. And I'm too small to keep myself safe. So safety is not that available to me. And the solution that our primitive nervous system has to that is anxiety, right? Panic. 
because it thinks if I'm always paying attention, then at least I can see things coming that are going to hurt me. And of course, we know that we as modern human beings, we are these socially complex, highly intelligent, maybe even spiritual beings, if you believe that. Um, but we have to live our human lives in a very primitive meat suit. And so it will create conscious experiences that are not in service of our safety, thinking that it is. So our unconscious mind can drive us away from our power, drive us um, into into recurring patterns and relationships, thinking that it's loving us. Yeah. And these unconscious beliefs that we form in trauma, they they basically cannot be reached consciously. It's very hard to do that. So we can develop many tools for managing, right? When the, when the anxiety trains leave in the station, we see it leaving and we can manage it and we can try to work through. But there's a higher level of freedom available to us all where the trauma train or, you know, the, the anxiety train doesn't exist anymore because the unconscious mind now sees its only job is to keep you safe. And the safest you can be is grounded in a deep enoughness grounding into your gifts your ability to to be the the man that you are mm -hmm. now any of those triggers that used to ship the anxiety train out of the station they're now bringing you more deeply into the truth of who you are into lovability self-compassion and uh, that's as automatic and unconscious as the old response was right so Compassion is the way because we can see your unconscious mind is very powerful, right? It's it's creating experiences and responses that it thinks are safety for you and and showing it what's really safety for you is totally available to you. Yeah. Yeah, great share. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Greg. I appreciate that. Yeah. Right on. Justin, your new your new house, hey? Yeah, we uh just finished the last of the furniture stuff today. So uh, it's been a pretty full on last couple of weeks. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's honestly awesome. Um, I've even got my own office in this house. So I'm not in, kind of in the, my last office was like at, outside all the kid bedrooms and the stairs. So it was very like uh, busy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've got a group of people walking by all the time, but now I, yeah, it, it wasn't originally an office. It was at the, or the master bedroom had a his closet and a hers closet. Oh. And uh, we turned the his closet into a little office for me, and Amanda let me share her closet. So that's that's how I knew it was true love because uh, I got to share the closet space. <laughs> but her closet's huge, and I don't have that much stuff, so it, it was like pretty easy. Two t-shirts and one set of seed pants. You're laughing. Well, exactly, I'm a minimalist, so it's easy. Yeah, too funny. Awesome. Um, yeah, where do we go from here? Uh, anybody else have anything uh, that they'd like to share in this space um, that they've experienced, the strategies that they've used perhaps to kind of um, shift their behavior or otherwise the strategies they they use in some of these circumstances? Or even like an aha moment, like, holy shit, like this has gone on a lot in my life and I uh, had a, I never was able to really put my finger on what it was. Or what I had a little bit of that. Yeah. A little bit of the aha uh, there, Dan. Yeah, the dismissive of <laughs> The thing is like I was like man I can look back and see that so many times and the friction that caused in my marriage it, you know it was kind of epic actually <laughs> and uh yeah and it gets to that push pull like we had said where it's like it gets too far or got too far mm -hmm. on a kind of a constant basis and now it feels like we're in a pretty stable place so you know it's good information for when things kind of flow out of here I guess but uh wish I knew this 10 years ago yeah fair enough yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I, I said earlier, Justin, like I, I'm more of like the dismissive uh, avoidant strategy in predominantly in my history. Um, and uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's almost like as you uh, you get to that intimacy level where you're you almost feel um, you almost get afraid of like being needed or having to rely on someone in any way. And so you're like, no, I got this. I'm, I'm good. I'm autonomous. I got my shit. I, I, I don't need to rely on anybody. And, and uh, it's really interesting because I can't like, I initially I would have thought oh, I can, I can, I can't think of where that behavior would, would be shaped. Like what it was in my upbringing that um, would, would create 
some of those strategies in, in my relationships. Um, but the more I would think about it, you know, despite having a good family and upbringing and those kinds of things, like there's these little nuggets that start to add up and you're like, oh, that's really interesting. Like I spent a ton of time on my own because I was like, not, I was really different from my parents and my brother. So I kind of felt that like I didn't really get me. And so I spent a lot of time doing my own thing. And I had a few like small little um, experiences where, um, you know, coming from a mother or something like it, it could be, it seems innocuous today, but when you're that age, like could be really like hurtful and, and, and scary. Right. Like, uh, and I just said, when I was young, I remember kissing my mom on the lips and she said, you know, I'm not your girlfriend and actually kind of like pushed me away. Um, you know, that strict staunch, like French Canadian Catholic woman, like just not, not meaning to be mean, but just being like, no, no, like kind of overly, overly brainwashed and strict in a way. Um, but anyway, like just shit like that. And you start thinking about that going like, Ooh, you know, going there is, is dangerous, you know, going there is hurtful, right? Like, so I need to just stay independent and autonomous and look after myself. And you can see where these things kind of tend to show up. Um, and then you can like have compassion. It's like, oh, okay. Like I'm not broken. This isn't like a diagnosis. I'm not going to have to get meds for it. Like whatever it is, like, it's, mm -hmm. you know, I can have compassion for myself. I can understand where that's coming from. And then when you see somebody, your partner exhibiting maybe their strategies that they've, you can have rather than just being like, oh, you're being awful or why are you doing this? You can be like, oh, interesting. Like I can maybe understand where this behavior could be coming from and you have a little more empathy and stuff. Uh, but the funny part you did miss is when you talk to your partner about these things and they're like, oh, which attachment style do you think I am? You have to be really careful the way that you answer that question. Um, so uh, that part, yeah. Because well, me and Amanda chatted about it and, you know, she said she took the test because she was wondering which one she was, but she also told me she knew which answers would get the secure attachment type. So I'm not 100% sure. Uh, yeah. But that's but it was secure attachment. But there's been definitely some times where I thought like, hmm, she could be on the anxious spectrum as well. Because there's, you know, oh. there's been times I've been in Alberta and she's like freaking out that I'm going to leave and stay in Alberta. And I'm like, I'm just going to visit my friends and family for a week. Like I'm yeah. not, you know, but Regardless, I feel like um, I could see that being a patchy point though for some people. And yeah. the thing that we talked about though, because I think she was talking about like one of her exes or my, maybe it was my sister or her partner. But when you get like an anxious person and an avoidant person together, it can cause a lot of chaos because the anxious person wants to be closer. And so we'll be kind of like yeah. sort of neat. But the avoidant person's like, no, no, you take your space. And then it creates this Totally. sort of bigger duality separation for both of them to like work through. And then I think that can really be, tri be triggering for some people on both sides of the spectrum because the anxious, the avoidant person's like, you want me all the time. And that person's like, you never want to be with me. And it's just, the whole... so. It's true, man. And one thing I came across and I didn't read into it too much. And I'm curious, Joel, if you know anything about it, but it, it, it said something like oftentimes those types are attracted to each other and they actually enter into relationship and it, just repeats that same chaos uh, and I didn't look into it with any like uh true thing or otherwise but I'm curious if, if did you hear that too or you you know about that too Joel yeah for sure it's and you know I I would just want to reflect what Greg said it's really important for us to understand that none of these things are our fault like oh yeah even if we even if we think of society like um the avoidant attachment style is considered love like jealousy is considered love when jealousy is actually a display of the anxious attachment style. You know, I've even had partners, ex-partners, you know, there's a guy flirting with them and I'm like, I'm in a place where I'm like feeling more secure and they're like, well, what, don't you care? How come you don't care, right? It's like, there's this kind of weird sense that the anxiousness is about love. Um, so, you know, I find that a very interesting thing. But in terms of what you're talking about, Dan, and I know we're getting close to the end, it, it, I find and I think it was David Data also framed it as like a home space. We always search for our home place. So when we were children, how our parents parented us, how our parents were with us is what we learn is love. Like neurologically, we learn that as love, right? And so if our parents weren't there, then we'll tend to maybe be more anxious and we'll seek other people who aren't there, right? Because that's what feels like love to us, even though 
in our minds, our logical minds are going, we know that's not love, but our neurological makeup is saying, well, that, that feels more like love to me when that person's not there. That feels more like love to me when that person is anxious, you know, or anxious avoidant or whatever. So, um, I think that that's why we tend to seek out those kind of relationships and get in those patterns um, that you're talking about, Dan, or that's what I've noticed with my clients anyways, because yeah. they tend to, they tend to go what's, to what I call the home place. And mm -hmm. as Greg was saying earlier, um, there are tools you can use around that, like in terms of breaking your state, breaking your body state, those, you know, neurologically creating new pathways, but it's work. It's definitely a lot of work that you have to, engage in i know you know for me i i was a for myself and i i'm not going to share and you know recommend it for everybody but i was a big fan of exposure therapy for myself so i went through a stage of being anxious like when i was younger i was super anxious super super anxious and i would get jealous really easily and then in my journey in relationships i ended up getting into polyamory and stuff like that which pushed shoved me right up against my anxiousness like immediately and it made me learn that learn how to i guess deal with that anxiousness and go through the middle of it oh. and actually kind of love it i guess and break it in a way so, so i landed in a place where i'm definitely more secure um as a as a result of that journey but i do tend to still now the avoidant piece is still there once in a while i notice in my weakness so I was probably anxious avoidant when I was younger. I remember getting really jealous and possessive and clingy with my partners. But at the same time, when, when they were too much, I was like, eh, right. It was like, I had this weird thing. So, you know, I, I dealt with the anxious part, I guess, in my own way through the exposure, exposure therapy, putting myself right into the middle of my fear um, and, and realizing that you know, the, my partners were choosing to be with me, not not because of the things I was doing, but more because of the who I am. Mm. So it's, as men, we tend to get into problem solving space. So it's like, it's more about the answer is always, and it always sounds simple and repetitive. It's like, who am I in this situation and really centering ourselves in that space? And because you, you can't be present if you don't know who you are either. So it's really you know, and for myself with the exposure therapy, in terms of my anxiousness, it was like, I really learned who I was in relationship with my partner and, and whether, and that they might be attracted to other people and might not be attracted or whatever. Right. And who is it that they're actually choosing to love? Is it, is it my problem solving ability and trying to control and, and shape shift to make them happy? Or is it more about just me as who I am? Right. And then learning that that's what my value is. And that's, you know, that's ultimately what it always comes down to in the end. But, you know, Joel, you mentioned that you've noticed people seem to often go right, fall right back into those types of uh, relationships where the, where the opposites may attract and such. And I've seen that so much through my yeah. years with people and experienced early on in life myself. And I've heard it said, and I don't know how much value one can hold on this, but maybe it's just the fact that until we figure it out, the universe is just going to keep slapping us on the head with it. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's and that's just... verging into the spiritual part that, that Greg was alluding to. I think that's yeah. when we really start to examine those things. Yeah. yeah. The universe does, you know, the more we avoid ourselves, the more the universe is going to slap us on the back of the head. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately. <laughs> yeah. That is, the most appropriate closing line sentence that Absolutely. We for. so thanks for that mark um we are at nine guys awesome to see you justin thanks for joining uh when you could all of you guys thanks for joining uh this is a this was a good one i i'm uh i'm glad we recorded it and um i'm i'm uh i'm happy with uh yeah with, with everything this is great so thanks for being here appreciate each and every one of you um if you ever want these recordings just let me know like we've we've got them um, and, uh, otherwise I'll see you next week. We'll, we'll dive into, uh, empathy. Awesome guys. Awesome. Okay. You guys appreciate it. Easy guys.